I'd like to begin by asking our cadets to take their positions. Ladies and gentlemen, please join us for the presentation of the colors and our national anthem. Say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming? Whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight? O'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the Thank you to the Ramona High School JROTC cadets and to the soloist Alexander Rupp for that very fine presentation. I'd like to take a few, a few moments to recognize our guest today and if you could hold your applause to the end. Please be seated. First, I'd like to recognize Maureen Nunn, a board member of the Nixon Foundation, and her husband, John. Maureen's mother, Helen Drown, taught school with First Lady Pat Nixon at Whittier High School, and the two became lifelong best friends. Michael Elsey, director of the Nixon Library and my counterpart at the National Archives. Jim and Sharon Goodwin, two great supporters of the Nixon Library and champions of all things Richard Nixon. Craig Clements, a member of the Nixon Foundation President's Society and an Army veteran who is so supportive of our activities at the library. Alexandria Walker, Congressional District Representative who is today representing our good friend Representative Ed Royce, Chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Jean Hernandez, Mayor of the City of Yorba Linda. Peggy Huang, Yorba Linda City Councilman. Greg Daddis, the Director of the Chapman University's Master's Program in Warren Society a retired colonel and former head of the history department at West Point. Harlan Glenn, a veteran with us from World War II who was shot down over Korea and is a true American hero.
And I'd like to welcome the World War II veterans from Round Tree Gardens and all others in the crowd. Thank you for coming and thank you for your service to this country. I'd like to introduce Navy Chaplain Hylon E. Chan Williams, who will deliver our invocation this morning. Ch Chaplain Chan Williams has been a pastor for nearly 25 years and is now Dean of Christian Education at the Ang Anglican Churches of Pentecost. His awards include the Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal, the National Defense Medal, the Global War on Terrorism Expeditionary Medal, and the Sea Service Ribbon. Chaplain Chan Williams. Let us pray. Eternal Father, strong to save, we thank you for this day when we, the grateful and the gracious, are here to remember, remember, remember. We remember those who laid down their lives for freedom and democracy around the world. From war to the mere rumor of war, let us honor the fallen but not forgotten. We remember Marines and sailors, soldiers and airmen. We remember Coast Guardians and Guardsmen. God, we're asking for you to understand and let us understand that freedom is not free and that the cost that they have laid there on their lives for was indeed righteous and assured. We ask that you allow us to remember indeed that we rage against those who rage against us, that we not go gentle into that good night but as Nixon said we traverse over deep valleys and across great mountains so that freedom indeed is assured so for these things oh God we come here today to ask for your blessing and to assure us indeed that we can remember lest we forget we do these things we say these things in your name let us all say amen America, and that and guide her through the night with the light from above, from the mountains to the prairies to the oceans wide with foam god bless america my home sweet home god bless america my home sweet Thank you, Chaplain, and thank you, Alexandra. I'd like now to introduce Colonel Chad Blair. Colonel Blair is the Assistant Chief of Staff for the Plans and Strategy for the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force at Camp Pendleton. He was commissioned a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps in 1992. 
and will go on to have a remarkable career and serve in a variety of theaters abroad. In 2012, he received his master's degree in national security and strategic studies from the Naval War College in Rhode Island. Colonel Blair has, attended, has attained over 4,200 flight hours. His personal decorations include the Defense Superior Service Medal, the Legion of Merit, the Meritorious Service Medal with a gold star, Air Medal with Strike Flight Numero One, the Navy and Marine Corps Commendation Medal with three gold stars, and the Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal. Please welcome Colonel Blair. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. I'm deeply honored to stand with you today commemorating the sacrifices of those military men and women who have laid down their lives in service to our country. I would like to acknowledge the Gold Star families who are here today, those who have lost a loved one in the line of duty to this great nation. It doesn't matter how much time has passed, no words of condolence can even begin to adequately console our survivors' grief. And while grief from loss may change throughout the years, it never leaves us. Memorial Day is a day unlike any other. Beginning in 1868 as part of the post-Civil War Reconstruction, we have come together in our communities, our cities, our towns, to place flowers and flags on the graves of those who have given their last full measure of devotion to this country. The Civil War represented the darkest chapter of American history. Devastation and sacrifice tore into every community and into every American home. With 600,000 deaths, almost every American lost a loved one. While much had changed in the United States since the Civil War, American patriotism, grit, and toughness remained unchanged. Fifty years after the Civil War, we again saw the patriotism, grit, and toughness of young Americans in the face of battle during World War I. One example is the Battle of Bella Wood. Near the Marne River, in France for 25 days during June of 1918. U.S. Marines backed by U.S. Army artillery fought off the German Spring Offensive. Americans prevailed, but at the cost of 1,062 U.S. casualties. Today commemorates the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Bella Wood. Less than 25 years after World War I, millions of Americans united to go to war against the Axis power in countries and places they could never imagine before. These Americans, both in and out of uniform, pulled together to protect America's values and America's way of life. Thousands of Californians volunteered to fight in both the Pacific and Atlantic theaters of war. One of these volunteers was a young Richard Nixon, who accepted an appointment as a ju lieutenant junior grade in the U.S. Navy in 1942. From Henderson Field at Guadalcanal, Lieutenant Nixon supported Allied attacks throughout the Pacific, including the fierce battles of the Solomon Islands, and Philippines campaigns. Many of these men made the ultimate sacrifice to protect our country. More than 400,000. They followed the example set by thousands of service members before them. They gave their lives when our country faced a grave threat. After victory, Americans returned home to build the most prosperous and mighty country the world has ever seen. Following the Great Depression and a World War, President Nixon and the rest of his generation molded our nation 
into a powerful economic pr protector of the free world. In 1971, under the leadership of President Nixon, Congress declared Memorial Day a national holiday. President Nixon understood the obligation every American has to remember the sacrifices of past generations. He understand that these sacrifices unite us as a country and inspire all of us to live to the preceding generation's greatness. The willingness of some to give their lives so that others might live never fails to evoke in us a sense of wonder and mystery. On this Memorial Day, we remember all Americans who gave the last full measure of devotion in defense of our freedom. And we honor their loved ones who carry on, having themselves sacrificed more than we can ever imagine. May God bless all men and women who gave their lives for our country. May God bless the family members left behind. And may God bless the United States of America. Semper Fidelis. Good morning, everybody. My name is Mike Elsey. I'm privileged to serve as the director of the Richard Nixon Presidential Library. Forty-five years ago this year, as a young U.S. Marine, I had the privilege of escorting the body of PSC Mark J. Miller, the last Marine killed in Vietnam before the Paris Peace Accords went into effect. So it's truly an honor for me on this special day of reflection and remembrance to introduce our honored guest, and a true hero, Chief Warrant Officer Herschel Woody Williams. Lieutenant Colonel Herschel Woody Williams enlisted in the Marine Corps Reserve on May 26, 1943 in Charleston, West Virginia to join the great struggle for freedom in the Pacific theater of World War II. On February 21, 1945, then Corporal Woody Williams landed on the beach in Iwo Jima 
Two days later, American tanks trying to open a lane for infantry encountered a network of reinforced concrete pillboxes. Corporal Williams went forward alone with his 70-pound flamethrower to attempt to stop unyielding machine gun fire. Covered by only four riflemen, he fought for four hours while under attack by tremendous en enemy fire. He continued to wipe out one position after another. As his assault continued, he came upon a Japanese bunker, and he approached close enough to put the nozzle of his flamethrower through a hole in the bunker and killed all of the occupants. These actions occurred on the same day that the famous American flags were raised on Mount Suribachi. Mr. Williams actually witnessed this event. For his heroism, Mr. Williams was awarded the Medal of Honor by President Harry S. Truman in 1945. He retired from the Marine Corps Reserve in 1969 at the rank of Chief, War Chief Warrant Officer. He spent the next 33 years, and a special thanks for this service, as a Veterans Affairs Counselor with the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. In 2010, he established the Herschel Woody Williams Congressional Medal of Honor Education Foundation, on whose board of advisors he continues to serve. And more recently, literally the entire country has gotten to know Woody as the man who flipped the coin to kick off the Super Bowl earlier this year. <laughs> we are honored by your presence today, Mr. Williams, and I invite you now to lay the wreath and offer some remarks. Thank you. What a divine blessing we have received this day to have a beautiful sunny day for a great purpose of being here. Thank you for permitting me to come and be a part of this solemn program. When I awakened this morning, one of the first thoughts that went through my mind was where in this great wide world could this country boy from the little state of West Virginia awaken and feel safe and protected but here in America. And that's because others are making it so. If you believe you are blessed as an American this morning, would you just slide, slide your hand up very slowly? 
Thank you very much. I appreciate that, and I'm sure thoughts going through your mind are also those of mine. I'm very humbled to be standing where other individuals stood who were giants of America. One of the things that struck me as we were viewing the museum this morning was a statement that President Nixon said that, believe, that I believe fits everyone in this group. I believe in America. And I'm grateful for this opportunity to come and celebrate this day of memory with all of you. The observance of Memorial Day is important for America and for we Americans. It serves to remind us that the gift of freedom did not come without sacrifices. Most of those sacrifices were made by people who volunteered and who took an oath to protect us and the citizens of this great country, but also to give a freedom to a people who had never experienced that gift or to help restore that precious gift to a people who were losing it. We must keep this day so that those who follow in our footsteps will also appreciate the loved ones of families who have kept us a free people. While remembering those of the past, we must not forget those of today. In this current conflict, over 7,000 sons and fathers and husbands and wives and daughters and brothers and sisters. Other relatives have made that sacrifice for a people they don't even know. We must also remember the 15,000 of our own, who today are standing in harm's way, someplace in this world. And let us also remember that they personally answered the same call that the Lord gave to Isaiah in verses six, verse, or chapter six, verse eight. And I heard the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for me? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. As I stand here in those footprints of great people, great generals such as General Mathis, who spoke here before, many other leaders of America who made great contributions to our way of life. President Nixon and many others who have gone to their rewards. It makes me very humble that I would even be invited. I am honored. It's very difficult for most of us to talk about ourselves but since you sent the invitation, <laughs> you asked for it. Now, I don't have a PhD, which means I'm not a politician, <laughs> or a scientist, or a noted author. So I have a little choice. I can only talk of what I have been taught in life. I have no specialty, no great wisdom. I'm a country boy who was fortunately born in America. Born in a free country that was earned by other people. 
The day I drew my first breath, I received a gift that I could not have earned. It had been earned by others before me and handed me, handed to me, but with an obligation. That gift was the gift of freedom. I'm not wearing my medal today. And I did that for a purpose because this really is not about me. It's about them. And we can put in that classification a great number of individuals and peoples. Until I received that medal, not so much for what I did in that February day of, that changed my life, but for the sacrifice of others who gave their lives protecting mine. And for the group of Marines who were willing to testify and think me worthy to wear our nation's highest valor award. So I wear it when I do in their honor, not mine. Have you ever gotten out of bed some morning and stopped long enough in our busy lives to ask yourself the question? I have many, many times. Why me? Why me? What have I ever done that warrants what has happened to me in my life? To be blessed as I am. To live among a people who have a deep value of life and live in a society like no other in the world. So this is a very special day. America's heroes, we must not forget. They were Americans who loved their country so much that they said their devotion, with their devotion and love, you may take my life, but you cannot take my freedom. If I may, I wish to quote some words that a dad said that comes very close to answering that question, why me? I'm compelled to the question that has twisted inside me like a dagger since the moment I knew you were gone. Did not we, it asks, we the parents, point you toward death? Did we, did not we, out of our own unqualified love of country and rigid definition of duty, rear you to die at war? We deliberately cultured you in the current unfashionable belief that each person is responsible for themselves and that a man is, a, is the fabrication of his own consequences. We told you failure is a personal affair. Not to be laid off on power or race or gender associates or influences and you listened well 
you accepted that what you were to work with and granted yourself no excuses and from the first we taught you reverence to the flag the law our traditions our institutions there was never a doubt you would enlist nor was there much doubt in view of your compulsion to make the first team that you would serve as a Marine. As I was listening to earlier remarks talking about President Nixon being in the Navy, we're grateful for his service, but he sure would have made a good Marine. Because <laughs> he said, I do not quit. In many instances, that person that that father spoke about could have been a Marine by the name of Jason Dunham. He was a corporal in the United States Marine Corps. He and his squad were observing a cross highway for traffic that should not be there. When suddenly an explosive landed among he and his Marines. Without hesitation, he pulled his Kelvar helmet off, placed it on the grenade, then placed his body on the helmet. He sacrificed his life for his Marines. We have met his folks a couple times. Oh yes, they're sad and they grieve, but they are extremely proud of his character and his devotion and dedication to others. So with that, I'd like to ask a question. How many of you, at some point in time in the history of America, had a relative of any degree, any nature, any relationship, who sacrificed their life serving in the armed forces of this great country we call home and America? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I would ask that those of us who were fortunate enough to get home and fortunate enough not to lose one of our loved ones, could we show our appreciation to the others who did? Would you join me? I was raised and grew up in a country home, long ways from city. Uh, we had all the amenities. We opened the windows for air conditioning. That helped, at night particularly. And we had gas lights when they would burn. And we had a self-maintained telephone system that the neighbors had to keep up. There were no such thing as snow days. Who ever heard of a snow day? The main difference was 12 inches deep, you still went to school. There were no miracle drugs, no radio, no newspaper, no school buses. Most of our parents could hardly read. My mother completed McGuffey's second reader. 
Most schools were very small. Usually you had the same teacher from the time you started until the time you graduated, if you graduated. But it was that force, it was that group of people who grew up under those conditions that entered into World War II. They were already tough because they'd lived through tough times. So sacrifice was not an unusual factor in the lives of we who were raised during the Depression. I had no desire to be in the military. I'm a happy farm boy. But I was told because of what happened at Pearl Harbor, our freedom, our country was in danger of being taken over by a foreign force people we'd never heard tell of. As a country boy, all of us, we were taught it was totally wrong to take a life. Suddenly I was placed in a position that if I was going to survive, I had to kill another human being. For all of us, that took a tremendous adjustment. Re-education. And then when we came home, treatment facilities didn't exist. In my lone state of West Virginia, we had one VA hospital, 200 beds, inpatient only, 230 miles away. I didn't even know it existed. Readjusting back to civil life was difficult. On that day of February the 23rd, 1945, a day that is an icon of America today, not because of what the Marines did, but because of Old Glory. If Old Glory had not gone up on Mount Suribachi that day, Iwo Jima would have been just like any other island forgotten. The guy running that program knew, I believe, that that was important and consequently changed his operation completely. Memorial Day is for many every day, just not one day. It's a special day, a day no parent or wife or relative ever wants to happen. But it does in war and will always but I'd like to close with the story of a mother. My mother was not a Christian lady. We didn't even have a church in the community. Oh, she had a great big Bible. I can't remember her ever reading it. I can remember her getting it out and recording in that Bible when a child was born or when somebody was married or somebody died. That was the only record we had that we even existed in this world. This mother certainly suffered more than most. There were two Vietnam veterans who had had a good service record, active in Vietnam, but they didn't feel satisfied. They wanted to do something else. 
They wanted to continue to serve, so they became volunteers at a veteran's cemetery to assist people in locating grave sites when they didn't know where they were. It was a hot August day, and they were in their uniform. And a 69 or a 70 model Cadillac DeVille looked almost new, but it pulled in, and this Vietnam veteran had some thoughts that he <laughs> wished he hadn't. He said he couldn't help himself. The thought went unwanted and left a bitter taste. And he said, she's going to spend an hour, and my left hip is killing me, and I'm ready to get out of here right now. <laughs> but I volunteered. His buddy Kevin, who was waiting at the gate to really close it and lock it, said my uniform had lost its sharpness because of the heat and the sweat. But I walked over to her halfway up the walk, and she looked at me like with that old woman's squint. <laughs> Ma'am, may I be of help in any way? And she took too long to answer. Yes, son, you can carry these flowers for me. I seem to be moving a tad slow these days. Oh, my pleasure, ma'am. Well, it wasn't too much of a lie. She looked at me again and said, A veteran, I see. Where were you stationed? Vietnam, ma'am. 68 to 71. And she looked a little closer. Oh, wounded in action, I see. Well done. She smiled at me when I said, there's no hurry, ma'am. And she said, son, I'm an 85-year-old woman, and I can tell a lie a long ways off. My name's Joanne Westerman, and I have a few Marines I'd like to see one more time. She headed to the World War I section, stopping at a stone, and she took a bunch of flowers from my arm and laid them on top of a stone, and she murmured something, and I couldn't make it out, but the name on the stone said, Donald X. Davidson, USMC, France, 1918. She went up a row or two and put a bunch, another bunch on a stone that said, Stanley J. Weisserman, USMC, 1944. She paused for a second and then said, two more, son, and we'll be done. She looked confused. She said, where's the Vietnam section, son? I seem to have lost my way. And I pointed with my chin that way, ma'am. And she chuckled a little. She found the one she was wanting and placed a bunch of stones on Larry Weisserman. USMC 1968, and the last one on Darrell Weisserman, USMC 1970. She stood there a moment and murmured a few words that I couldn't make out. But she said, okay, son, I'm finished. So I asked the question, were those your kinfolk, ma'am? Yes. Donald Davison was my father. Stephen was my uncle. Stanley was my husband. Larry and Darrell were our sons. all killed in action, all Marines. Then she started making her way slowly back to her car. I yelled at Kevin, told him to get on the other gate post. And when that old Cadillac came puttering around the hedges and Headed for the gate, I called to Kevin 
attacked hut. We both rendered a final salute to her as she drove out the gate with two worn out veterans giving her a send off that she deserved for the service she rendered to America. meaning the true words of duty, honor, and sacrifice. He said, I can't be sure, but I think I saw a final salute from that old Cadillac as she passed through the gate. God has blessed this country with so many people who have sacrificed so much so we can have all the privileges of a free country. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for honoring us with your presence, a very special presentation. We will conclude today's ceremony with the 21-gun salute and the playing of taps. Please stand.